Hello and welcome to my P5 examination. Today I will be telling you a story about sea, shell, sand, and seaweed. I did my thesis in the Explore Lab at TU Delft, which means that we focus on our fascination as a whole and really fall down that rabbit hole. And my fascination stems from this canal bike, which was dredged from the canal. I found it here in Delft, actually. And it was covered with mussel shells and algae. So immediately I began to think, perhaps these materials have a connection. After all, we often say for food, what grows together goes together. So if what grows together goes together for food, could it also work in a material context? So I wanted to explore this relationship between algae farming and mussel farming as creators of raw materials for architecture. I started to fall down this rabbit hole. Um, one of the things that I do that's a little bit different from typical bio designers here in the Netherlands is I always look at historical precedents. So I looked at how mussel shells and seashells were used historically in architecture, but also seaweed, seagrass, um, and algae were used. My methodology for my thesis research was making, also known as material-driven design. And my process was about creating ratios and material tests to demonstrate how we can build with these materials. Um, after I had created all my base ratios and base materials that I was pleased with, I then examined the properties and colors uh, from these materials. I compared and contrasted them and tried to think about the best possible applications. Then I scaled up to larger scale models to look at their potential uh, construction and architectural applications. And then the tectonics from these materials, from the joining of these materials, uh, were what formed the final language of my architectural design. So typically we have in the traditional architectural design process, we start very large scale from like a site level. And from the site, we tend to funnel into the building form and its shape. Um, these two really speak to each other. And from there, we tend to think about building interior and building materials lastly, oftentimes. Uh, with material-driven design, this is how my process ended up going quite a bit, starting with the materials first, informing the tectonics, but also informing the choice of site, the building form, the building interior. And what ended up happening was this completely interconnected design process where the materials were relating to all these different aspects and informing each other. So I ended up with a very uh, driven and connected project from the materials themselves. I started off my research process by creating a seaweed sketchbook. Um, and in this sketchbook, I not only documented the precedents that I was learning from and using as reference, um, the, the sketchbook also functioned as a lab book for many of my testing and my recipes, as well as my notes and observations. And one of the most important precedents I found here in the Netherlands was how seagrass used to be used to build dikes in the Netherlands. And um, in fact, there was such a history and a culture around using seagrass as a material that you even had special typologies called seaweed sheds to hold the bales of seagrass. Um, so we used to have a history and tradition of using these materials, uh, unfortunately not anymore. Um, so I really wanted to look at the best case scenario, how do these materials used to be used, how can we use them today? These are the results. So the first application I developed was a seaweed paint. I based this off of the Danish precedent of mosfawa, mos meaning moss, fawa meaning color. Um, it refers to the Irish moss glue base that was used to create these paints. So I whipped up a batch of this Irish mosfawa um, and I discovered that the reason it was only used on ceilings uh, historically was actually because if you touch the paint, it comes off on your fingertips. Um, but I found that by adding uh, microalgae to the, um, to the paint mixture, it actually stabilized the paint mixture and also added these brilliant blues and greens uh, from the microalgae that I was using. Um, and I further developed different seaweed paint ratios using the seaweed as a glue for the base to come up with different stains with the microalgae and different uh, formulaic compounds. So on the left here, we have a stain uh, from the seaweed paint. And I further developed these paint applications. I also tested it on a mural in Poland and also in Poland uh, with traffic design. Um, 
with Jacek from Chat Fit Design and Blanca Burva. We tried screen printing the first test um, on of seaweed uh, microalgae paint onto a seaweed bioplastic. And I came back to Rotterdam and I trained up with fellow student uh, Sebastian Pop, and I ended up making my own microalgae posters for my thesis. Um, they are hanging up in the room of the exhibition, and you can totally feel free to take one as a souvenir after this. The next application I developed is based on the precedent of the Japanese noritsuchi, uh, which means uh, glue plaster. Again, the seaweed here is used as a glue for the plaster. Um, it increases the workability of the mix, so you can use the plaster for a longer time. Um, and it also makes the mix a bit spongy. Um, so Noritsuchi is based on using a Japanese red algae um, that comes actually from the same species as uh, Irish moss again. So this was my attempt to try and find a ratio that works with a local Dutch species. And I also experimented with using sargassum as a fiber in the plaster instead of hay. Um, and I found that the, uh, the clay encapsulates the sargassum and prevents it from rotting. So this uh, can be used in this case. Typically, you don't want to use seaweed uh, as a fiber necessarily in construction uh, because it tends to rot. But when you encapsulate it in clay in this case, the clay sucks all the excess moisture out of the seaweed, the excess humidity, and that prevents it from rotting. Uh, so I found this to be a relatively stable application. I think after eight months now, it's totally fine in my apartment. So I feel quite comfortable saying that Sargassum can be used as a fiber in this circumstance. The next application I developed was a shellcrete. Um, historically, especially in coastal cities around Florida, the Faroe Islands, um, shells were heated up to 800 degrees Celsius to create quicklime uh, because there was no limestone in the area to create cement. So this was how they did it. Um, now, I didn't have access to a kiln, but I did have my oven, so I heated gently the mussel shells that I had from waste uh, from eating mussel shells uh, to uh, about 200 degrees Celsius for about half an hour to an hour and then I crushed them and I was able to come up with different uh, mixes of glues, uh, algae glues and uh, also animal-based glues to come up with a working ratio. Not all my ratios worked as you can see some of them were quite fragile. Uh, but qu some were quite sturdy, um, adding the gelatin and animal glues in particular really increased the strength of the material and I performed an um, initial compress compression test which showed that the material is very similar to concrete. Um, the other beautiful thing about this material is that depending on the shell species you use, you end up with a completely different color of material. So that while the mussel shells were that were utilized to create like a beautiful white shellcrete, um, the reddish brown, almost brick-like color comes from using cockle shells instead. So the species that you use has an impact on the overall appearance of the material itself. Finally, the last material I developed is a bioplastic, um, usually the poly polysaccharides in algae to create a plastic-like material. And this is a more contemporary application. It's something a lot of biodesigners are currently experimenting with in the Netherlands. Where I really tried to push the research forward was by experimenting with different colors, natural colors, especially using spirulina in the mix. I found that by using about a tablespoon of sugar, it really stabilized the mix per base if you're adding microalgae like spirulina. And that's how you can get these really beautiful blues and greens. After I had made all these different materials, I then kind of laid them out in this design spread uh, similar to what we would do in interior design to just play with the materials, contrast them, examine their properties, their textures, um, and, and understand too this, this spatial quality of these materials. One of the things that I unfortunately do not have in the exhibition today but had planned to have in the exhibition is this also this one-to-one uh, -one scale piece that I call the seat. It is a seagrass upholstered beanbag chair um, and I embroidered actually seagrass strands on it. I, it debuted at the Delft Maker Fair um, where it was very beloved by everyone who got to sit on it and relax on it and I even had a little reveal moment where I opened the lining and could show people that inside was seagrass uh, where they were quite surprised. 
Um, in fact, one student loved it so much that he sent me this selfie of him sitting on it and really enjoying it. Unfortunately, it was loved so much that somebody decided to run off with it and steal it from the makerspace and the science center. Um, so I think somebody should call Ikea because these are totally just flying off the shelves, can't even keep them in stock and storage. Um, so I would have really loved to have this in the exhibition today, but unfortunately, uh, yeah, it's, it's somewhere else, hopefully someone in someone else's living room. The other one-to-one -one applications that I developed are mainly construction applications. We have on the left here a uh, masonry application with the shellcrete and the seagrass insulation, as well as a timber frame application. So the masonry application is uh, from left to right, Sargassum Lamestain, which we're actually made in collaboration with Brianne Reinders, who's a fellow TU Delft student. She also focused her thesis on circularity and using seaweed. Um, in the center, we have seagrass insulating blocks. That's because a lot of times people will tell me, Catherine, seagrass is such a fantastic insulator, but I don't like working with it loose. I would prefer to have an easier install method. So by compressing seagrass with a bit of clay as the binder, I found that I could create these insulating blocks instead, which are really easy to install. And then finally on the outside, we have the shell creep bricks. Um, and this entire model was made with a seaweed clay masonry uh, infill um, between the bricks, which allowed me to be able to also disassemble the model and move it and reassemble it at a later point. The next one-to-one -one application we have here is a timber frame application. Um, so a classic seagrass infill, loose insulation is applied. Um, and then for this, I really wanted to test, can you use seagrass infill similar to hay and construction principles? So I put the chicken wire over it and I plastered on top of it with the sargassum clay plaster. Um, and I feel quite comfortable again saying that seagrass in construction is very, very comparable to hay. We'll work a lot with hay. Um, you can even use it as a substrate for mycelium because it's so similar in properties to hay despite the salt content. Um, so this, this, this is a solution, a traditional solution, traditionally inspired solution that really works. And then on the opposite side, we have a Fermacell board with the sargassum clay plaster also applied. I think this is a really good example of taking a conventional material that we use today, like Fermacell board, a waterproof plaster board, and showing how we can put the clay plaster on top of it. Um, clay plaster in itself not only regulates the sea seaweed in it uh, sucks the extra moisture out of the seaweed. It also helps regulate the humidity and the VOCs in the rooms that we are in. So by using plaster over potentially plastic paints, we could actually create healthier building interiors. The last application one-to-one -one scale that I developed and made was this Zeglas lamp. And this was made from the bioplastic. A lot of people tend to look at bioplastic as a textile resource. In this way, I was thinking about the stained glass, especially the stained glass I was seeing around Delft, and using the different colors and patterns and grading techniques I saw around town to come up with this stained glass approach. Finally, I think that there's a huge potential for these biomaterials, um, but I really think there needs to be more research done on them. We need to really do a lot of research and we need to push it forward to integrate it into the building market. Uh, so what I did was I put a lot of my uh, recipes online, my base recipes, um, and I want to encourage people to check them out on my website, also from my YouTube channel, learn how to pr prepare some of these recipes, empower themselves, um, and maybe push this research a little bit more forward into actually the building industry itself. And I was also able to contribute um, in an article for Rumor for TU Delft in their bio-based issue, um, everything over the past four years that I've learned about seagrass versus algae in construction and kind of the best way to approach using these materials in a safe and healthy way for construction. The next part of my thesis was taking all of this research and channeling it into a design concept. I decided to situate my, uh, my design concept as a more theoretical application, a uh, 
speculative project, you could say, uh, where in the distant future, the Netherlands is flooding. So honestly, not so speculative. Uh, but the green government greenlights funding for carbon sequestration projects and research in large-scale seaweed and shellfish farming in the Oosterschelde. So the materials that are developed from my research are then used to create a building that serves as housing for all these people flocking to the area, as well as people living looking to leave their existing homes and downsize, empty nesters, all come together and live in this very special housing complex. This housing complex also serves as a symbol of hope and innovation for a future in this climate change reality. So going in line with the theme of uh, seaweed and seagrass materials, I wanted to use a typology connected to the sea. Uh, in this case, I chose an amphibious housing uh, typology and one that would stay moored in the site, but move up and down with the water. Another thing that I did was I was able to actually go to the Oosterschelde, uh, actually with Rayan. I was able to go and see the water and what was actually down there in terms of seaweed farms. Um, and one of the things that uh, I can't remember if it was Rianne or her boyfriend said at one point was, uh, I hate these zombie houses. We were in an area that was filled with summer housing and the same exact tiny summer house in beige was plopped down like times a hundred in the same building plot. So I thought, you know, I have to create some sort of um, of ownership over the housing that I'm creating in this area. I don't want to just create zombie houses for people. I want people to feel like they know which house is theirs, to feel like it belongs to them. So that was something I took away from our, our trip um, and uh, something that I decided to channel into my also my design concept. Another thing that I looked at was all the different species I could observe during the winter. Um, and I actually ended up picking my site based on the area that I observed the most uh, seaweed diversity, which was Shellpook. And Shellpook is interesting because not only is it the place of a current seaweed farm at the moment, um, it is also historically an area that was severely impacted by the floods of 1953. So you actually see along the coast, there was a massive uh, dam at one point, or dike, um, that when the flooding occurred, it broke the dam and completely flooded the area. So their solution was to let the sea take that area um, and not rebuild the dam. Um, and instead, eventually, they built all the large uh, dam works along the coast um, but of course, as climate change is getting more and more extreme, they keep having to close the, uh, the dikes themselves because the water levels are becoming more and more intense. So this is an area that is vulnerable, has been vulnerable in the past, and it was the area that I chose as my site. Now I chose the area on site called Praunia Hill uh, as my location for building because this is actually an area that has a lot of elevation. Um, so you really get the best of both worlds here. You get a actual elevation. You get an area that's in danger of being flooded, as you can see in this mapping from approximately 2030. Um, and, you know, I wanted to see what would happen over time. We know that the Netherlands is low lying, but yes, this area is particularly pr prone to potential risk from flooding. So here you can see the elevation mapping. Um, there's about a three to five meter difference in elevation here between the highest point of the hill and the lowest, lowest part is actually below sea level. Um, and there's actually a three meter difference in the tides. Now using sounding, I was actually able to, um, using a sounding map, able to calculate because of this, the height of the poles needed for my amphibious housing project uh, by calculating the high and low tides and also the average depth of the area. This is the master plan for the area, so where I tended to situate the house, but also think about how would you approach the house. 
Uh, so this is an area that's very popular for people who love nature, who love hiking, uh, but also for sailing enthusiasts. One of my coworkers likes to actually sail down into this area. So I had the idea that perhaps one of the ways you approach the housing complex isn't just by land, but by sailboat. And perhaps you commute by boat to your work or <laughs> to, to enjoy the sea itself. Um, so on the left hand side also too, we have here the, uh, the seaweed and the mussel farming farm. Um, we also have a research center uh, that would all be places of work for people who live in this complex. Um, and there's also of course leisure activities like bird watching and hiking for also people who are retired in the building complex. So one of the things that I modeled my amphibious housing design off of was actually by looking at the mooring posts of boats themselves, watching as how they moved up and down with the tides. Um, and uh, so I got to go down to Shellpook and take these photos to really study that a bit further. I thought a lot about how to situate my building in the site. At first I was just thinking of situating it on land and then in the worst case scenario, this building would be flooded and would be flood resilient. Um, but then I started to play around a lot with like a semi-flooded circumstance where the building not only would be flood resilient, but would also move with the water itself, so move in balance and in time with the tides. Um, so I ended up creating a little uh, semi-flooded condition, um, as well as dunes around the building to serve as an extra coastal defense. So the funny thing about dunes is that they're so important to the Dutch landscape that if you go to Schiphol and you take a picture in the bathroom like I did, you will notice that the walls are covered in dunes. And to me, dunes represent this really incredible dichotomy of Dutch landscape where they're both natural and yet man-made. Um, and, and to me, the Dutch landscape is very artificial. It's composed of reclaimed land. But how does a doom naturally form? It forms naturally by seaweed that clumps together on the coast that, and then rolls into these massive dunes. So the dune itself is born from seaweed, born from washed up seaweed, and yet can also be man-made and serve as a coastal defense. So this was something I found very fascinating, something that I also thought could bring even more biodiversity to the area and really improve my project. So this is the site conditions at low tide. This is it at high tide. So mostly flooded, but still have access to your boat. And this is it completely flooded. Um, there is a secondary dock that floats with the mooring poles of the first dock so that you can ideally, hopefully always access your boat, um, even in the worst case scenario. And this is how it looks in the Southwest facade. And this is how it looks in the Northwest facade in these different conditions. And this is just a little animation to show how that floating works actually. So the placement of this building isn't just about water, it's also about the ways that humans can begin to interact with nature around the building. For example, like bird watching, or by approaching your building by boat as you say hi to your neighbors on a morning walk. The building design itself came from starting with a courtyard typology, um, where the green space is really on the inside. And then from that, I divided that courtyard topology into different sized module units based on my target and users and reorganized them into a larger building complex. So I tried to think a lot of the times about whom I'm designing for, the community needs. So I was really trying to target young people that are coming to this area, couples, um, researchers, young families, um, and also people in the community already that are looking to move out of their home into a more accessible living space and are looking for a community, uh, looking for friends and looking for people that they can bond with over their love of nature. So first off, I created this module for empty nesters or elderly couples. Um, and this typology of module is really accessible. Um, it's designed on one floor plan so that you can really move through the space and at the same time maybe have your grandkids over to watch TV together. 
The second typology here is for the researcher. It's a little hard to see in this plan, but actually I designed this in three dimensions so that there is uh, extra space included. Uh, so even though it is a small space, I wanted to use the verticality that we see a lot of times in Dutch interiors to have clever storage so that it doesn't feel so small. This is the typology for young couples. Now this is a design for a young couple that might be more mobile. So there is a staircase, it's on two floors. Um, more on that a little bit later. This is the uh, plan typology for young families. And in it, we have a niche um, that acts as a uh, extra couch or living space in the living room for socialization, but then on the opposite side actually becomes a loft for the child to sleep upon. And that's again using the verticality of the room. I made uh, each level about three and a half to four meters on the interior. Uh, but that's also because from my experience working, uh, children love to climb. So <laughs> when you give them a loft, they get really excited. The placement of every module in the building was super intentional. Um, I tried to place openings towards desired views, but also with as much privacy consider considerations as possible. So each module was placed in a way so that your courtyard was as private as possible without your neighbors staring straight onto your lawn. Uh, so that is why I placed them in this way. And then I came up with different stacking iterations. One of the limitations of building with an amphibious typology is that you're really limited to two floors. And then after that, the building itself becomes too heavy really to float. So I ended up experimenting quite a bit and I ended up settling on the uh, configuration on the right hand side because I found that that was the way it could really maximize both privacy, but also the number of units for approximately 50 people in the building. So this is what happened to the building itself when I remixed this courtyard typology. You know, in a traditional courtyard, you have public access around the building, and then you have this extremely private courtyard. Um, you still have private access to courtyards in this building, uh, this reassembled courtyard building, but um, it's, it's a little bit more public while still being private. Um, and the other aspect of it as well is that I have this closed off access point in the center so you can access your home, but I made that access point very narrow and also walled off on the opposite side so that the public doesn't feel compelled to enter this tiny space. It feels private. It feels like you're intruding, so you stick to the outer perimeter of the building. This is the basement plan, which might look a little unremarkable. It serves as a hollow floating basement um, for the typology, but um, actually this basement serves as the stronghold for uh, all the climate system. So when designing the climate system, I wanted to design a climate system that was as self-sufficient as possible, especially in the case of catastrophic flooding. Um, you want to still have access to your power and potentially also to, to water. Um, there is a cold water supply that is external. There is also a sewage supply that is external. Um, and that's just because if those connections break, they can eventually be repaired. But the most important thing is with the storage of cold water in the building, you will still be able to use your cold water. Um, there's also gray water reuse from your sink so that you can flush your toilets. Um, just trying to design for a worst case scenario. This is the ground floor plan where you can see the different modules situated um, and how I place them. And this is the first floor. Um, so before I talked about mobility of the younger couple typology. However, we can't always plan who's actually going to be in our buildings. So I tried to modify and plan for the second floor to actually have flex housing. So if there's somebody who has disabilities or um, is less mobile, they can still comfortably be in these spaces. And there's also elevator access. Um, there's also a community garden where people can gather and, uh, and get to know their neighbors a bit. This is what the open plan living typology looks like on the interior. But this is the uh, difference between that and this uh, design for the young family. There's a niche integrated into the living space to save space. 
And the niche also has a Zeichlas lamp in the back, so you can use it as a little reading nook if you like. And here on the opposite side of the niche, we see the loft for the children's room. So again, using the verticality and the dimensions of the height of the space and using that to the advantage in the design. This is the researcher's designed room. <laughs> this is the room for the researcher, um, which has also the ability to have excess storage installed vertically, as well as underneath the bed itself, so that you're maximizing the floor pan space as much as possible. And then, of course, in case of an emergency, but also be if you like to be social and get to know your neighbors, you'd like to have an appropriate socialization point. In my apartment complex, there isn't one, so it ends up being the elevator most of the time. So in this case, I created a community garden where not only people can have their own little plot to garden with, it's a point where you can grill with your neighbors, get to know them, have conversations with them, and have uh, community meetings as well in this space. And of course, from this space, you have a beautiful view of the sea. Going from this into tectonics, the structure and construction of the building itself, one of the things that I did was um, I was limited to a timber frame construction, and that was purely because, again, the weight of the building needs to be quite light above the, uh, the structural foundation in order to float. So limited to timber, but historically timber was used sparingly in Dutch architecture. You had more access to clay. Um, but then looking at these historical precedents, one of the things that I realized over and over again with the timber structures I could find is that they were very exposed, they were very ornamental, um, and they were very uh, highlighted and prominent in the design itself. So I spoke a little bit about the um, building principles for amphibious housing. I really only found one precedent for amphibious housing before uh, starting this project, the housing project on the River Moss. Um, I ended up meeting with a water design expert just to try and come up with a sort of guidelines and rule, rule of thumb for designing amphibiously. Um, so that what that is, is having a double basement foundation where one is tied to the ground and one is loose. Um, a lightweight construction on top of this double basement foundation. No more than two stories high, again, to, due to the weight. There needs to be access to the construction for water to flow in and push the construction up because if there isn't, the pressure can build and actually begin to break the construction. Um, finally, the height of the mooring poles themselves are dependent on and reflective of the elevational and tidal conditions of the site. So this is a road map and guide to the different marine materials and how they ended up being utilized in the building itself. Of course, we have the Irish moss and the sargassum being used in the clay plaster, uh, but we also have mussels here being used again as a hard packed insulation. Um, mussel shells are pretty good at being used as a replacement for polystyrene. Um, you just need to add a thicker dimension. Of course, and then on the outside, we have a seaweed spirulina uh, paint blend um, in different hues, depending on the house, so that every person has a sense of connection and a feeling of ownership over their own space. They can recognize their house visibly. And of course, then as insulation, for the regular timber frame applications, we use seagrass. So this is an example of the construction system. It's composed of timber columns with prefab wall elements. Then on the inside, of course, we have the clay plaster. And on the outside, we have a shikui lime plaster made from Irish moss and mussel shells, which are local to the area. Um, and then, of course, on the outside, we have the seaweed microalgae paint applied. So one of the important things is community engagement with the com construction, and I wanted to empower the community. Uh, learning how to clay plaster or plaster in general is super easy. Even I learned how to do it in just a one-day course. So instead of having to wait for your landlord for like 30 days to repair a minor hole in the building, you can do it yourself if your kid smacks into the wall or drives a nail through the wall. Uh, you can just fix it on up. 
Um, and what this will do is actually improve the lifespan of the building itself, but also be a way to connect the community by taking charge of the repairs and being engaged in the building process. One of the things that I wasn't so sure about initially was whether to expose the structure or to keep it hidden. I have actually in the corner of the room a massive axonometric drawn without the structure, um, but based on my sketch modeling, I ultimately decided to expose the structure because I think it says something about the way that the building is built. It really shows the construction itself. So uh, that was why I ended up eventually just choosing to expose it rather than to hide it behind plaster and keep everything uniform. So this is a detail of the roof with the different prefab elements combined together. Uh, but this roof overhang is pretty significant. What that allows people inside their homes to do is on a rainy summer day to open up all their windows and merge the outside with the inside. So you can hear the rain, smell the rain, experience the rain, and you have this merging of outdoor space, indoor space, this connection to nature through the building. This is a detail of the ground floor to the first floor. What I'm trying to draw to attention here is the thickness of the walls themselves. I was once told by a representative for mineral wool <laughs> that having thick walls is unappealing for people, but I disagree. Um, I think that with thick walls, you have the opportunity to create niches in your own window elements that can even be used to stack books or as an extra seat in the space. So I don't think having extra thick walls are, is a bad thing. I think it's something that you can aesthetically plan and incorporate into a design. And then lastly, we have these details with the prefab basement on the ground floor, um, here also with a wall element. So you may have noticed, in fact, that the entire structure is prefab, um, and that is because, and that's because this entire building is designed to be disassembled, so that uh, eventually, if this project didn't work out in this experimental location, you could actually disassemble the building, move it to a different location. Um, as architects, we can't always plan for when our building will be demolished, but if we design it to be disassembled and dismantled easily, we can hopefully prolong the life of the building uh, onwards in different locations. And ultimately, what I really wanted to create with my thesis project is a home by the sea, from the sea, for people who love the sea. Thank you.